talked about how these couple of invitations in your bulletin are a chance for you to plant a seed. Uh, but the truth is, is the reason that we plant seeds is because we've got God's word, his seed inside of us. Uh, he fills us up with his presence and he is near to us. And the truth is, is it's such a privilege to be a part of his family and have the chance to share that uh, each and every day. Something I've said before, and I'm reminded by Tim Tebow and Caleb frequently, uh, that the greatest thing, the greatest way we could ever love anybody else is to share the name of Jesus with them. And so, because we know what that means to have it in us. We know what it means to have Christ in our lives. And so think of each of these cards as planting a seed because you know what that has done in your own life. Would you stand together with me as we read from Mark chapter 4, verse 1 through 9, the parable of the sower. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things in parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked out the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100 times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of God. Please be seated. Thank you, Pastor Matt. I'm reminded of the words of that great country philosopher and singer, Brad Paisley. There's nothing worse than a long sermon on a pretty Sunday. But I've got a lot to share with you today. It's what happens when I don't preach a week. I just kind of load up and ready to go. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we know that you're here. And we thank you that you have not left us alone. Thank you, Jesus, for sending your spirit. I pray that you would convict and convince, draw us closer, examine our hearts. If there are those who have never given their heart to Christ, maybe they're morally good, maybe they're just even spiritually interested, but they've never given their heart to Christ. I pray that today would be the day. For those of us who have been in the harvest and sometimes grow weary, may we be reignited with the possibilities and with the opportunity to scatter the seed of your message and let us believe that you're going to bring a harvest because you're the great harvester guide and direct in this in Jesus name we pray amen the word contagious means transmissible by direct or indirect contact with an infected person sounds like a great definition doesn't it the word contagious often sparks fear into our hearts, especially after a pandemic. Recently, you know, I'm a silly old grandpa, but recently we had a little precious little girl, and they brought her home, and we were so excited. But the very next day, my three-year-old grandson got stomach flu. And the very next day, his daddy got the stomach flu. And the very next day, our six-year-old got the stomach flu. And I'm praying as a grandpa that my little granddaughter, who is like three days old, does not get the stomach flu and that her mommy doesn't get it. Well, we thought we'd weathered the storm, and so Karen Robin went up to F Cleveland and spent the day with them and then a couple days and came home, and Karen got the flu, <laughs> and Robin got the flu. Whatever was up there was pretty contagious. You notice, I stayed home. <laughs> But, but let me tell you, Grandpa was concerned. 
But you know, Hannah and the baby, neither one got it, praise God. And the rest of them got over it. So there is this negative element that we think about something being contagious. But there is the opposite of it, and that is when something becomes contagious in a very positive way. In other words, it's like someone would say, our new members are very contagious. They're excited. There's enthusiasm. On a sports team, and I coached a lot of ball over the years, I could tell you when my teams were going to probably lose because negative attitudes, defeatist attitudes had crept into the group. And uh, we see this happening in church. We can be negatively contagious or we can be positively contagious. And this happens. I mean, all it takes is someone to get an attitude. You know what an attitude is? I mean, you know, uh, a tude is an attitude on steroids. But an attitude, you know, when somebody gets a negative attitude and it just kind of spreads through the whole congregation, it can be devastating to a church. Pastor Rick is used to hammer into my thick head the importance of keeping joy and celebration and keeping unity, how important that is and vital it is for the church to go forward. But a positive attitude can be just as contagious and I want to quote that great leader of our building program, Phil Hunley, because his phrase is contagious. It's a great day to be at... Yeah, you know, whenever I say that, I feel, oh, <laughs> I get a smile, and it makes joy in my heart that I'm a part of a great church that's trying to do something for the kingdom of God. So today I want to talk to you about the positive side of being a contagious Christian. In our text, it makes it clear that we are to be sowers of the seed, but not all seed, as we will see, brings forth a harvest, but we are to sow the seed. Number one, we are to sow the seed of the gospel. Listen, it says, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, we as Christians are to be scattering the seed, the message of Christ, the hope we have with people. And, you know, I, I guess as a grown up around farms, I, I really didn't understand this seed flinging except when we had to plant grass different places. But, uh, you know, we had different kinds of implements you planted with the bean planter, the corn planter. You know, we had that kind of thing. We did a, we even had things that would spread the seed when we wanted to scatter it out. We had a special equipment for that. But the point is, regardless of how we go about it, we need to be flinging the seed of God's word out there in culture, planting it, visualizing it, that it's going to bring forth a harvest. Neil Cole, in his book, The Organic Leadership, says in reference to transformation, the impetus of a changed life provides the momentum of a movement. In other words, when we see as believers others coming to know Christ, it becomes infectious. Others, we want to share more. We want to see others come to know Christ, drawing others in and, and helping them to hold tightly to Christ through thick and thin. Our changed lives validate that movement. And as we move forward, we want to be that kind of a church that's sharing the gospel message like we will at Music Under the Stars or so many other events that we want to have happening here that speak to people. Transform transformation in all of us should be constant. Us being transformed into the image of Christ so that others will know Christ. You see, we're not just out for conversion. We're just not out to see people confess Christ. That is vitally important. But the real issue is, are we going to introduce them to Christ and help them to come to transformation, becoming more and more like Jesus? Let's face it, all around America, we got a lot of people that say, well, I confess Christ. But they're not transformed. They're not becoming like Christ. They're not being led by the Spirit of God. They're saints that sit and soak 
and then sometimes sour. Well, the word conver conversion in the Greek is epistropho, and it carries the idea that whenever someone gives his thought and life to a new direction, it always involves a judgment on the previous way we lived to a new vision of who we are becoming. It turns oneself around and refers to a man's conversion. This presupposes and includes the complete change under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, every one of us who confess Christ need to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit to allow him to work through us and in us and in our community. In Acts 26, 18, Paul tells of his mission to turn people to hope. He says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, or to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among themselves those who are sanctified by faith in me, in Christ. You know, in the Old Testament, we have an example of Moses as an Old Testament character who set an example of not only conversion but transformation because Moses made a commitment to renounce the things of Pharaoh's house to become the man of God God would have him to be. In Hebrews eleven twenty four through 26, it says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Did you notice that? A short time. Did you ever notice the things of this life are pretty short-lived? You get a new car, it smells like a new car for about six months. And you know as soon as you get one, somebody's going to put a door ding in it. You go on a vacation, and you come home, and you think, what a great time, but is that all there is? Now i got to go back to work. Um, you've heard me tell about the bag I have on my outside in the garage shelving full of phones they were the best in the world and now they're just junk laying there no Moses had a transformation the transformational lesson is for any of us men or women who truly want to be followers of Christ must be intentional about transformation becoming more and more like Jesus and that focus on becoming more like Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, should make us contagious. As we read God's Word, as we study God's Word, we are not going to be able to be silent about the hope we have in Jesus. You're going to want to share it. You're going to want to tell others. See, as the transformational leaders, and all of us should have that in our heart, transformed by the power of Christ. We must have our focus on leading others to conversion and transformation. We're not just called to be confessors. We're called to be followers. Do you remember? And this isn't in my sermon. I'll throw in an extra. I will take up an offering for it. In Mark, the eighth chapter, it said, listen to this. He called everybody. Just not his disciples, but everybody. And he says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. When you took up that cross, you're basically saying, I'm dying to self, I'm dying to the things of this world, I am now allowing Christ to be the center focus of my life. I serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that requires us not only to be converted, but to be transformed and to be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit in the sense that he now directs my path. I got all confused about my days and I ended up out at the football field thinking they were having practice and they weren't, but I had a moment with the junior high football players at UL where I got to talk to them and wow, it was a blessing. I thought, thank you, God. I didn't know I was going to get to talk to them. A couple of days later, I, I'm out on the field helping them, some of the kickers, and as I'm helping them learn how to kick, just a little part-time having fun with these guys, I thought, you know, Jerry, this isn't about learning to kick a football. 
This is learning to how to share with these young men the truth of Christ. And I don't know what God's going to do, but that's my goal. I want to tell them about Jesus. I want them to know Jesus. See, we've got to have that in our mind. So as we think about moving forward as a church, as we think about music under the stars, we have a responsibility and the privilege of just not inviting people, but engaging people. We need to be out there talking to people. Yesterday, Anna put on a fabulous run race here. But the next time we do that race, I went, yeah, she did. It was great. I, I came in dead last. I was in the golf cart <laughs> following the last runners or exercisers, whatever you want to call them. Anyway, but you know what I noticed? We didn't have very many people. This is not her fault. This is not a criticism of her. It's a criticism of us. We needed more people there from this body engaging those who did show up who are not a part of this church, loving on them, talking to them. Because when I go to one of those things, there's just not enough of me. I can't get to everybody. So when we have these events, we need you. This is your time to shine. This is your time to speak up. And give Anna a big pat on the back for a great job. You see, we've got to connect. The seed fell on the soils. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Now, what we have here is the negative image of the soil, of the scattering of the seed. And you notice there's three things that happen. Some seed fell on the paths, and the birds ate it. Some seed fell in the rocks, and couldn't take root. Other seed fell in the thorns, and it was choked out. Now, I want to tell you something. Growing up on a farm, even though we didn't do that, or growing up in farm country, I can witness to all these things. When I used to work the fields, uh, I usually ran the disc and the harrow and the call to packer, and we would get the field ready, and I would run ahead of the planter. And we would make a swath. I would be out ahead, and Dad would be following me with the planter, and then we'd make the swath back. And, but I can tell you what happened. As we would make our swath back, I could see where we just planted, and you know what was there? A bunch of birds eating the seed before it even could get rooted. Every spring, my dad would say, Jerry... I need you to get that old tractor and that trailer and go out there and pick up rocks in the field. You cannot believe after five or ten years of picking up rocks, you'd think you got them all, and every spring more rocks would pop up. And I'd try to con my cousins into helping me. I told them what a wonderful job this was. They didn't buy it. We had soil on the top of the hill that was shallow you knew it you know you, you the ground was hard and we could just about anticipate on that ridge that there wouldn't be much growth there were places in the field where we came in and out we tried not to pack compact it but the ground would get compacted because we bring in equipment in and out and so we were trying to be very careful about mixing that up so that the soil would still receive the seed and then there were thorns. And I would, kid, they'd send me out in the field and they'd say, Jerry, go pull the milkweed. They had milkweed everywhere. I don't see it anywhere anymore. I don't know what happened. Maybe it was a miracle. <laughs> but you know what? I learned a vital lesson. My mother would make me pull weeds in her flower beds. If you pull up the wrong thing, you don't have to pull weeds anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you might get a licking <laughs> but there's the positive side it's rich soil my wife thinks I'm crazy 
I go driving out through the country around Indiana and out around Mount Gilead and we go past in the spring and I look out the window and I say, look at that beautiful field. And she says, it's dirt. <laughs> but I look at it and I say, no, that soil is rich. It's dark. It's rich. It's going to grow a huge crop. I can see it. I can s- I roll the window down and smell it. Ah, that's spring. That's a field. That's dirt. That's growth. That's life. And that same thing with us. We need to understand, yes, we're going to sling a lot of fe- seed out there, and we don't know what's going to happen with it. We can be very intentional and look, oh, then, for that really good soil. It's that person at the line at the grocery store that has sad effect can't see good anymore it's that teenager in your neighborhood who just seems to be drifting it's that person at work whose marriage is falling apart it's that person that you have contact with and now they've got a diagnosis of cancer and they don't know what to do there's rich soil all around us. And by the way, there's a lot of people call, questioning culture. They're looking at it and thinking, is this all there is? I don't want it. They're rich soil to tell them of the hope of Christ. Still other seed fell on good soil. And it came up and grew and produced a crop. Now I want to talk about a couple of people who experienced true transformation one of them was peter and i'm going to try and synopsize this but the apostle peter i mean this guy had every opportunity to become this dynamo for christ right out the gate he walked with jesus for probably close to three years he saw miracle after miracle and yet in the crunch as howard hendricks the great theologian said in the crunch he was out to lunch you know he denied jesus three times when he should have stood up and embraced him and was willing to stand up for Christ. And it was in that time of denial that Jesus looked at him and Peter went out and wept. Maybe a leadership principle for us in the harvest is we want to see conversions and not all people respond to the gospel as quickly as others. Peter had spent all that time with Jesus and undoubtedly had confessed him as we know in scripture multiple times and yet his life had not been transformed sometimes we want a quick easy program and I have been through every kind of training there is I guess over these last 50 years of ministry and training E.E., four gospel laws, share your faith without fear, uh, and, and numerous others. Matter of fact, my Thursday morning Bible guys, we, we just spent six o'clock in the morning studying how to share our faith. We worked on our testimonies. We worked on understanding how to share our faith. We worked on gospel principles, we, you know, all those sort of things. And now we're switching gears and going the book of nehemiah but we spent a lot of time i believe that is vitally important to know but we need to understand that not always always is everybody going to get saved the first time they hear the word of god how many times did you have to hear before you gave your heart to christ how long did you go to church maybe before you gave your heart to christ you see we can't give up. We've got to continue to speak the truth in love. Peter, in the Gospel of John, has a transformational moment with Jesus. Jesus asked him a simple question, and it's a question you need to ask yourself as you hear me talking about these things. And I'll put it in my vernacular. Jerry, do you love me? That's what Jesus said to Peter. Jerry, do you love me? Jerry, do you love me? Then go feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. 
See, that message just wasn't for Peter. It's for us. When we finally come full circle and realize that Jesus is the answer, he is the power behind us, do we really love him enough to tell others about Jesus? He had another, not only was this past powerful time along the Sea of Galilee in which he gives his confession of Christ. Yes, you know that I love you. Transformational moment, still not totally cooked. But there's another moment in his life that becomes very important because Jesus tells him, I want you and all the disciples to go and I want you to wait in Jerusalem until I empower you, until I send you the gift I have and we all know that that's the day of Pentecost. And on that day, this Peter, who had denied Jesus three times, had to be reinstated, now stands with the disciples in the streets of Jerusalem and preaches the message of Jesus Christ. And what happens? 3,000 people get saved. That's exponential growth. But why did it happen? Because Peter was a great orator? No. Because he was so faithful? No. It happened because he did what Jesus told him to do and the power came over him and he got the message out to the people. You may be imperfect, but I want to tell you something. Our God is not. And I was with someone the other day and they said, I just don't, they have a great opportunity for me. I don't know what to say. I've been thinking about it. I said, well, do all the thinking you can. Work on it as hard as you can. But remember this, the Holy Spirit will give you what to say when you need to say it. see Peter's life was transformed you want to do something really good as a church would you get on your knees throughout the week and pray that the ministry of this church would come under the full power of the Holy Spirit and that whether it's Jeremy or Matt or myself or some guest speaker when they step into this pulpit they step into the power of the Holy Spirit because I can write messages here we could even print them up in books we can pass them out on CDs DVDs even cassette tapes if you wanted to but unless the Holy Spirit is involved in that message we got nothing It'll just trickle off the end of my lips and fall on the floor. And that's happened a time or two. I want to talk to you about Peter because Peter, as I shared with you, became what I call a contagious Christian. And the question is, are you a contagious Christian? George Fox. I want to talk about George Fox. Uh, we're going back to 17th century England. Here's this guy who grew up in a religious home did not have much education but he was really trying to live a good life a pure life he respected others and as he became a man he began to feel this emptiness inside of himself now remember he was a moral person a good person but he knew there was something missing so the fox set out to try and find something to fill that. He'd go to these priests, history course. As a matter of fact, I double-checked this last night. You know, I talked to Siri, and she told me I was right. But George Fox went to these priests, and he'd tell them, I feel this emptiness. And one of them said, well, maybe you ought to take a little tobacco once in a while. Where do we get priests like that? Another one said, oh, if you just sing enough songs, you're going to be all right. Sing some songs. One priest, he was telling this priest all about this emptiness inside of him. The priest was looking at him and noticed that Fox had accidentally stepped on one of his prized flowers, and he chewed him out for it. <laughs> Needless to say, with that kind of advice, George Fox gave up on them. Fox said, For I saw that there was none among them that could speak to my condition. When all my hope in them and in men were gone, 
so that I had nothing outwardly to hope for, nor could tell what to do. Then, oh, then I heard a voice which said, There is one, even Christ Jesus, that can speak to my condition, thy condition. And when I heard it, my heart did leap for joy. Then the Lord let me see why there was none upon the earth that could speak to my condition, namely, that I might give him all the glory. A few years later, Fox would climb a hill called Pendle Hill, and he would get a vision of a great gathering. George Fox's life as a transformed man of God was not without heartache. He took on the religious leaders of his day. And they imprisoned him. D. Elton Trueblood records that Fox endured eight imprisonments as well as many beatings and one imprisonment took about two years out of his life. And I want to tell you a little bit about the prisons of their day. They weren't like we have today. They were a hole in the ground with a lid on it, and they would drop food down to you if somebody brought it to them. And you lived in your own filth and squalor. And he was willing to risk that. You see, in the life of George Fox, we see the transformation of power of Christ who took a religiously, morally honest and astute young man who was searching for truth and called him to a personal relationship and sent him forth to be a soul winner. And as you read Fox's journal, it's truly inspirational as you read about all he went through to share the hope of Christ. Fox became a contagious Christian for Christ. The seed produced an incredible harvest. We had that negative. We also have the positive. Still, other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and grew and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, even 100 times. And what we read in history, if I can synopsize this, is that from 1647 to 1660, as this man, George Fox, began to witness and minister 50,000 people were converted to Christ. How many? 50,000. He, by his example, also inspired 60 other people to go out. We call them the Valiant 60. They spread out all over the world. They were men and women, tradesmen, farmers, mothers, fathers, and they used printed literature to advance the cause of reaching Christ for England and other places. Like the New Testament apostles, these people defied the call of the religious leaders of their day to be silent, and they could not be silent. Instead, we see them actually demonstrating civil disobedience. They took the message to Europe, North America, and even to Turkey, they were prime examples of the sower that went out to sow the seed. George Elton Ladd, in reference to the parable of the soil, says the parable of the soil teaches that the kingdom of God is present in Jesus' words, but like seed sown in the ground, it requires a response. We can't make people respond, but we can tell them the good news. I read later that by 1690, 100,000 people had been converted by those early Quakers who went out with the message of Christ. In the book, Evangelism in the Early Church by Michael Green, he speaks of the motivation of the first and second century church. He says that they were passionately convinced that the truth of the gospel was real. The early church was, persuaded, was also persuaded that apart from that message, men and women, young people were lost and were headed for hell. This passion drew them to embrace, embrace the needy of their world. The Great Commission was their marching orders to fulfill their calling. They believed they needed to penetrate every aspect of culture, and that's where you come in. 
I can't be everywhere. Jeremy can't be everywhere. Matt can't be everywhere. Pastor Ray can't be everywhere. Our elders can't be everywhere. But together we can all be everywhere. We can penetrate the culture we're in with the message of Christ from the schoolroom to the lunchroom to the sporting field to family reunions. We can go with the message of Christ. Green gives five points, and I'm going to try and wind this down here quickly. Five ways the first century church reached out. Number one, they saw the secular world and its everyday environment as their place of ministry. They would go where people washed their clothes, places like bars. They took the message to the streets, anywhere anybody would li listen. They believed heavenly in personal one-on-one -on -one conversations as a witnessing tool. There was no hype, no manipulation, no soapbox or Tory, no four gospel laws at that point. I'm not against those things. Believe me, they're great tools. But it was one-on-one -on -one telling people of Christ. Let me tell you, I got a lot of memories as a kid growing up. But one of them that still blesses me but haunts me was a neighbor we had. He lived down the road, turn at the old country road and go down there about a mile or so. He had a family of about six or seven kids, and he was a drunk. He never came to church that I remember. But my dad, I think maybe because of the way he was raised, after he got converted, saw that man as a great opportunity to share his faith. Now, my dad was not a preacher. My dad and mom worked together. They were like a tag team group. They they would invite people to our home. And I remember that man coming to our home and they invited him and his wife to dinner. Probably somebody that most people wouldn't invite to their house for dinner. But they came over for dinner. And I remember seeing my dad out on our porch. I was just a little guy out on our front, our breezeway porch, talking to this guy, befriending him, trying to tell him about Jesus. And I remember one Christmas. See, at our church, we were dirt poor. And we put on little Christmas activities, you know, programs. That's the only time I got to wear my house coat to church. I was always a shepherd. <laughs> they never let me be the magi, wear a crown or anything. But I remember at the end of those programs, they would give us a piece of can a bag of candy. It was always hardtack. I wanted chocolate, but they always gave us hardtack. You know. But we were thankful it had an orange in it, and it also had a popcorn ball and you know so but I remember my dad thinking about those seven little kids who didn't get to go to church and he gathered up some of those bags and he took them and dad met dad at the door and he was drunk what do you want Fred dad said I just brought your kids some candy from the church and I remember watching my dad as a little boy wondering what in the world was going to happen he just stared at my dad in his drunkenness. And he said, Fred, you're the only man I would receive this from. I don't know that my dad ever got that guy saved. But I want to tell you something. I think he made an impact for Christ. He'll never forget it. Their homes provided the most natural setting for sharing with others about Jesus. They reached out by planting churches, and by planting churches, what they were doing is just finding homes where people could sit down and talk about Jesus. They didn't build great big sanctuaries. Probably in this first century, they would have torn them down and burned them and everything else. But they relied on the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach them, to call them, In the life of Peter and George Fox, just these two examples, there are three consistent things that have to be a part of our life. Are you listening, church? Number one is a personal conversion, commitment to Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. Secondly, they were led and obedient to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and you might add the Word of God. And thirdly, 
They each lived and proclaimed the word of God and the eternal hope in Jesus. They could not be silent. And what I need is a talkative church that's going to get out there and scatter the seed and tell people about Jesus through our school, through our youth program. I was talking to somebody. I, actually, I, I got to talk to a, a state patrolman last night. I know he didn't pull me over. But we were talking about, he was telling me how, this is incredible. I don't know how God brought this to me. I pulled up beside him. He's one of the troopers I know. He's in the parking lot out here. He was telling me about a terrible situation he just had and a little boy that needed help and how the grandma was going to take the little boy because the dad was abusive and drunk. They'd arrested him, whatever. I don't mean to talk stories up. But I said, boy, I wish we could get that kid over to our youth group to meet Jeremy and the rest of our youth workers. That kid needs Jesus. <laughs> this guy, things around us all day long. The other day, I, the Lord spoke to me. I needed to go somewhere, so I did. I thought, why in the world am I going? It was like an hour and a half drive. But when I got there, the Lord showed me real quick why I was there. And I stood with a man in a parking lot and wept with him and prayed with him over a situation that I had no way of knowing I was getting into. Will you be Christ to someone? And it's messy, gang. These people have issues that are hurtful and painful their lives are broken but you're the light of the world you've got the message oh, I'm tired I'm, let's stand up time to go home. let's pray father God I know that you're speaking to hearts there may be someone here today who has never given their heart to Jesus Christ Oh, I pray, Father God, that they, today would be the greatest day of their life. Maybe they've been religious. Maybe they honest, morally right. They're doing all the right things, but they know there's that giant God void. I pray, Holy Spirit, wherever they're at, either here this morning or by their bedside or on a walk today or on their front porch, that they would confess you as their Savior. For those who have grown weary in the battle, maybe grown cold to the truth, may you ignite in them a new fire. And may we see revival break out because your church is going to break out of the holy huddle and begin sharing the truth of Christ. Work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.